Good morning. Good morning. This is December 3rd, 2002. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Libraries Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. We are privileged to have with us today Everett Kimball. Good morning. I understand your friends called you Ev. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Ev, may I ask when and where you were born? February 29th, 1924, at Framingham Union Hospital. So that means you get a birthday every four years? How'd you guess? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not that old, really. No, you're not. You're just about 20 years old, aren't you? <laughs> What is your current address? Hopkinton, Mass. Hopkinton? Hop without an M. Okay. Without a G. And your marital status? Married. And do you have children? Three boys. Three boys. Can you tell us when and where you entered the military? When and where? Yes, sir. I went to uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Illinois. and. Uh, I left Framingham at December 30th, 1942. You enlisted then in, the, say, the greater Boston area or Framingham? Out of the Framingham Post Office, okay. where it was at the time. Why, why did you join at that time? Um, were you called into the military? Or? I volunteered. You volunteered? All my friends were going in, so. And you joined uh, the Navy. Why did you pick the Navy? You had choices, I guess. Well, it seems like the best thing to do to me. I thought it would be more adventuresome. Any uh, history of the Navy in your family? Anybody no, ever? No. No. And, and you said uh, friends had gone in too. Um, did they all go into the Navy? Yes. Did you go in with a group? Uh, well, it was or, just, or you're all by yourself. I was with Doug Taylor at the. A friend of yours. A friend of mine, yes. So the two of you went into Boston one day and signed up. Is that it? We signed up in Framingham. In Framingham, yeah. and now you've told us that you were sent to uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. For, yes. Is that were for basic training? Basic, yeah. Tell us what what they did and what you did there. Well, we. Supposed to learn seamanship and, and gunnery, mostly gunnery, but we still, you know, we still had to learn something about the Navy. Was there any place before Great Lakes where they decided what to do with you in the Navy, what particular jobs you would do, or did you go directly from Framingham, Boston, out to Illinois? Yeah, directly. And you are learning gunnery. What, what does that mean? Well, uh, how to use small arms and, and uh, 20 millimeter machine guns and uh, surface guns and so forth like that. All the, all the way up to, say, five inches or something yeah, like well, that? That was the biggest we had, five. And did you? Um, I'm not going to say did you like that kind of work, but were you interested in, had you ever had any experience before with, with guns, with firearms? <laughs> just small arms, that's all. You plunked 20, around with a 22, 22 or something. Plinking cans and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What time of the year you were in, in uh, you, you signed up in uh, December yes. of 42, so it was pretty cold out at Great Lakes, I take it. It was worse than this, and uh, it curtailed some of our, we couldn't do any close auto marching or, or running or anything, we had too many broken legs on the ice. Really? Yes, they had to curtail it. When you're at Great Lakes and uh, you're learning to go aboard ship, do they have ships there? Are you on a Great Lake? No, no. So it's, it's just, just called that? Basics. Basic naval training. And while you were there, is that where they decided what you would, what your job would be in the Navy? Well, I think all along they had in mind the armed guard because they were building the uh, Liberty ships so fast 
that they didn't have the crews to man them. So they ev even cut my uh, training shot so they could get us on board these Liberty ships and get the cargo overseas. For the purposes of this tape, would you tell us what a Liberty ship is? It's a cargo vessel. It's a three, uh, five cargo holes and they were loaded with the booms and so unloaded with the booms and they carried, well we carried sulfur. So it's a transport vessel. Yeah, a transport. And are these the ones that were made by the Kaiser uh, shipyards? That's right. They turned one out every 37 minutes, something Fair like that. that. Yeah. And a phenomenal rate of shipbuilding. And you, uh, you learned to be an armed guard on one of these ships. That's what, what they were training you to do. Yeah, the How gun. did they describe what an armed guard does on one of these ships? What did man, you... Man the guns. The, uh, they had surface guns and anti-aircraft guns. And the idea was to scare the enemy <laughs> away from the ship and you learn how to uh, trajectory and range and so forth and how to uh, load and unload. That was the most important part, unloading and uh, you know firing, then loading the ammunition back again so it'll be ready for firing again. You generally, when we talk about a transport, you don't think of it as being armed. Uh, how? How much armament did you have on board one of these? We had uh, about six 20 millimeter guns and aircraft guns. The and cannons, uh, 20 millimeter cannon. Yeah. Yeah, six and of those. The, the first ship I was on had a uh, five inch 50 surface gun, one of the old World War I vintage which was practically useless. Why is that? <laughs> you can, it, it just didn't work or it was well, inaccurate? Well, you consider the movement of the ship, the up and down and rocking motion, you couldn't hit a target within 10 miles. But it, it was, if you, <laughs> you happen to be lucky, that was the whole thing. Okay. If you hit a submarine, beautiful. How many five inches were there on the ship? One. And where was it? Stern. Right on the stern. Mm -hmm. Were you in charge of any particular gun or group of guns? Well, we were. We were um, trained to man all of them. Because if a gun crew got shot at one. do all the guns. When, when you get the title um, armed guard aboard a ship, when you're in harbor or in port and the ship is loading or unloading, are you also guarding uh, the ship while it's in that position? Oh, definitely. Or is it, is it just against the... Um, just against the aircraft or submarines. You were all times guarding the ship. The ship had to be guided at all times for subterrors. Someone could sneak aboard any time. You know, get through the uh, security at the gate. So you had to be careful. Because they could blow up the ship right in the harbor. Was there any? Uh, was there a marine contingent on board? No, there wasn't. It was strictly sailors guarding the ship. Okay, where did you go from uh, Great Lakes? Went down Gulfport, Mississippi for more gunnery training. Okay, they're gone. And that's where we learned to shoot the uh, large surface guns because we went out in the Gulfport uh, Mississippi to get the sailors used to the firing and so forth of the large guns. Tell us about target practice. What did you shoot at? 
No, oh, just random in, in the Gulf of Mississippi, in the Gulf of Mississippi. But when we got back on shore, we had target practice with planes flying over with, with the, uh, well, what they call those, a target behind them. A sleeve. The, the sleeve, you try to yeah. shoot it down. <laughs> this, how long did this training take you? If you started out in December, about where are we now in 1943? Oh, uh, they cut us short on our basic training because they need, as I said, they need the arm down. <clears throat> it was the middle of February when they sent us down to Gulfport, Mississippi. And, and how long were you at Gulfport? Gee, I can't remember. About two months, I think. So you were pretty thoroughly trained if you were there two months. And then say, let's say it's March or April of 1943. Where did they take you then? We went out to uh, San Bruno, California. And we, uh, it was more or less getting us ready to go on board ship. And uh, from there we went down to uh, Brownsville, Texas where the Liberty ship was being made that I was supposed to be on. And, because uh, it was a good time, we waited around, we <laughs> get a lot of Liberty down there. And then uh, we got a chance to watch them build the Liberty ships down there. It was fascinating. This was gonna be brand new then. Brand new. You'd be the first guys that sailed on it? Yeah, I missed the uh, shakedown crews because I had guard duty but they said the vessel would do 13 knots tops, which was good for a Liberty ship. But you never could use that speed anyway, because the fastest, you could only go as fast as the slowest ship in the convoy, which was six knots. <laughs> you could kind of sail circles around the, the rest of the oh, convoy. Yeah. When did you finally put to sea then, on board this ship? <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. All those dates of. Well, I can say we left there and went on board ship and went up to Mississippi to uh, Baton Rouge and picked up a cargo of sulfur. And uh, that was a <laughs> quite a thing going up to Mississippi. <laughs> and then we, from there, we um, went back to the Gulf of. Mexico and went out uh, around Florida up to New York. Where were you taking this sulfur to? Where was it going? Over to uh, Liverpool, England. Ah, it, you were going to take it over to Europe. It was uh, basics for ammunition. And uh, well, we waited in the York Harbor for uh, the convoy to make up. And they rigged us with, uh, oh, we had Sherman tanks on board and aircraft in crates on deck. And they rigged us up with, uh, they put the booms out to either side and ran a net along the side for torpedoes, catch the torpedoes. And then they stuck us on the starboard side of the convoy without, well, we're sitting duck, you know. <laughs> where, where did you pick up the tanks and planes? Where did you get that cargo? New York. Aboard? In New York. Yeah. When you went from Mississippi around Florida up to New York, first trip, tell us about the watches you stood and how, what procedures you had for watching for planes and especially submarines. Well, it was uh, two, two hours on and eight hours off. We rotated the, and every night, and morning, we stood. All, everybody stood watch. Of course, we were pretty well protected by the coast because the uh, zeppelins and the uh, aircraft and so forth could protect us along the coast. And still, they were sinking tankers off of uh, New Jersey at that time. Oh, they sunk a lot. Yeah. Did you uh, at that time see any hostilities or no. uh, anybody else submarine and? It wasn't really a periscope? If they were there, I didn't, we didn't see them. So you waited around New York Harbor now to make up a uh, convoy. Yeah. 
Uh, describe the convoy to us and, and sailing out. Well, of course, they all went out through the... Uh, well, first we went around the Statue of Liberty, what they call Ellis Island, and they demagnetized the ship so the torpedoes wouldn't be lured as easily. We, and then they also boxed the compass. And uh, of course, you had to demagnetize the ship so that it would be, uh, the compass would work. And then we sailed out. Uh, and out in the outer harbor, they made up the convoy. It took quite a while. Could you go back a second? <clears throat> and describe this process of demagnetizing a ship. Uh, does that call for putting cables around the ship? That was the whole idea, and grounding yeah. it. And and you did that in New York Harbor. Yep. Yeah. In that busy harbor, you guys are sailing around boxing your compass. All the way around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they could box the compass you know, all the way around. Yeah. And then came the day. Did you have any idea where you were going? They kept that top secret. Okay. And the fellow that uh, signed up with you no, I, way I, back then, he, he was gone, I take it. Yeah, I so lost track of him. You no. have all new shipmates. Can you look around that harbor for us now and tell us about the other ships you saw? Were there warships as your escort? The Navy ships, yeah. Uh, it all depends whether it mostly destroy escorts. And uh, let's see. Oh, of course, there's <laughs> a whole bunch of Liberty ships getting ready to go. And, and like oil yours, oh, yeah. And oil yeah. tankers, too. And where were you going? When you finally got there, where, what was your destination? We, we pulled into Liverpool Harbor in England. To unload the sulfur and the tanks and the planes and everything else. I, I'm trying to pin down a date here in, in reference to uh, the invasion of Europe. Oh, was, well, that was December. That was... Um, That's June of 44, June so 44. how close are we to that? Well, I made another trip before that. Okay, so you went back to the States. The States yeah. Did you? What did you carry on the, from Liverpool back to the States? Empty cargo? Nothing? We filled the village with water. So it was... Uh, yeah, to, for, for no the, cargo going the no other cargo. way, nothing. And where did, where did you come back to? What, where, where did you pick up cargo? In, in the States? Yeah. Maybe went to Boston. Now that is vague now. I know, you, you went to so many ports. I neglected to ask you, what did Liverpool look like oh. when you came in there? Had it been bombed? It had been bombed and they had worked 24 hours around trip, you know, around the day and night to uh, get it ready. They had to get it ready for receiving all this goods. And the poor stevedores were all wore out. And, uh, but I'll say one thing, they, they were a happy crew, the stevedores. And they, you've probably heard the English, they have to have their tea. <laughs> they had to come board in the morning with, the, with their teapots and stuff, <laughs> which was funny to me. But it was like a coffee break, I suppose. I think it's something like that, yeah. And uh, did you see any signs of the uh, the German bombing? And, and more important, were you in a raid at any time? Did not, you see anything there, no. like that? You, when we got there, the uh, you could see the damage that they hadn't fixed, and the and the oil was all over the water and all the piers were covered with oil from the sunken ships and so forth. Really? But they had made it available so they could unload ships, which I gave them credit for. How do you get sulfur in or out of a ship like yours? What form is the sulfur in? Bulk. 
So the, exactly. these big clam shells would come yeah. down and pick it up, okay. And that was another thing that I liked. They had a system where they pulled the little railroad cars up on a hill, and as they needed them, they'd release the cars and they'd come down under the uh, unloader and uh, they'd tip them over and dump them into the cargo uh, onto the little trains they had on the dock, which was, <laughs> I thought was pretty unique because it was all done by gravity. And, uh, was, and it was, and the elevator was run by water power. So I thought that was. That's good common sense, isn't it? Common sense, yeah. yeah. Any uh, adventures on the way back to Boston? Uh, again, did you have any sub scares or um, shadowed by German planes or anything? No, we, uh, we had sub chasers dropping uh, ash cans, they called them. But that was as close as we got any action. Okay, uh, did you come back alone or did, did they run convoys in, convoy. in both directions? In convoys, yeah. And you picked up another cargo. I don't know really what it was. Okay, and back to England? Back to Swansea, South Wales. Swansea? Well, whatever it, we had on board ship. It has a, a high tide there and then a low tide. Mm -hmm. They have tides that are uh, very high and very low you know, there. You'd have to come in on a high tide, yeah. And yeah, we picked up we picked up coal there, because England's good for coal. Oh, the Welsh miners, that's correct, yeah. I, I think we brought that back to the States because the British had oil burners and coal burners. So they'd, they'd go to the States with their coal burners. When they got there, they'd switch back to oil because we could, they could oil from the States and go back that way. And we brought coal back to the States. That for, for the ships to trip. pick up on the way back. Did you have drills while you were at sea? Uh, did you guys get practice with your guns for that day when you were? Oh, yes. We, we, not as much as I'd like, because after a while you, you lose the uh, routine, like setting up the magazine on top of the 20 millimeter gun was an awful job. Then we had training in loading those the 20 millimeter cannons? Yeah, the, the yeah. magazines. Can you tell us again, so few people have experienced what you did, what is it like to be part of a convoy at sea? You said you had to go as, you could not go any faster than the slowest ship. That's right. Was there somebody always hanging back there that you guys were saying, for oh, gosh sakes, I, I wish he could go a little faster? Did you feel more vulnerable because of these slow ships? I, I felt we're quite vulnerable, yeah. Did you see anything of the larger ships, the the uh, the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, when they so were the Queen Mary? You did. We were fascinated with the speed. We come up over the horizon. Next thing you know, it's <laughs> yeah. That's not waiting for any convoy <laughs> at all. In fact, my brother was on the Queen Mary. Was, you know, he's a Oh, what do you call them? Well, a passenger carrier. Troop <laughs> ships. Carrying the, the army. And uh, what can I say? <laughs> Were you at any time um, in one of those wild Atlantic storms that we <laughs> see in the you know, the, the movies always show everybody uh, getting in terrible <laughs> storms, ice storms and cold and uh, oh, were boy. your passages rough in the Don't North get Atlantic? Me started. <laughs> you know, we, we had, we were 30 feet in the water and that's pretty deep for a Liberty ship. So when you, the storm came, 
instead of going over the waves, you punched a hole right through it, and it would come up over the over the bridge, and, and it. After a while, the Sherman tanks on deck, they were held up by, by 12 by 12 beams on cleats. It hit so hard, those big beams would come loose and float around, which was dangerous, because they could you know, smash right through the portholes. But we didn't, but oh, what storms those were. While all that was going on, were you expected to be back there on the stern with your five-inch gun watching for s something? With yeah, you had to keep a watch, yeah. You're two hours back there right on the stern of the ship. Well, we had the starboard and port watch up on the bridge, and we had a watch in the bow and two in the stern at all times. Yeah, I do. You get you know, question, what could you see with a storm? But Nothing much, I would <laughs> suspect. England, Wales. Now, I have in my notes here that you also uh, were at North Africa, is that correct? Yeah. We, we, um, <laughs> when, when were you there? Is is it after the trips to Wales and? Uh, well, we went from uh, Southampton. We went from Swansea to Southampton and made made trips to Africa from from uh, Southampton over to Algiers and Oran, bringing all kinds of stuff over to supply the 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 army yeah. over there. Tell us about sa sailing through the Straits of Gibraltar and up into the Mediterranean. You're, uh, you're getting to see quite a bit of the world. Well, it's just like a vacation, because uh, there wasn't any action at the time, you know, any action. And um, it was good to see that part of the world. Did you get ashore uh, when you got to Algiers or any of those places? Did I get a what? Did you get ashore? Did you get any uh, liberty? Yes. Gee, Algiers, oh, poverty. I couldn't believe people live like that. Sewers running down the gutters. And, but then what got me was the compounds where they left all this supplies. For miles you could see view, uh, jeeps and tanks and ammunition and stuff stored getting ready for the invasion. Well, you're also uh, getting to where the German Air Force was pretty strong. Uh, did you suffer air attacks uh, when you went no. into the Mediterranean? No. At night you could see the uh, some of the bombs and stuff, the flare, you know, the big light up and searchlights and so forth. When you made a trip into the Mediterranean, from Southampton down through the Straits, are you alone now? You're not part of a convoy? Well, the only one ship could go through at a time, so that was kind of stretching out the convoy. Is that to, what you mean? Yeah, to go through the Straits, did a group of ships have to go in through single file? Is that what you're yeah. saying? and then form up on the other side again. Boy, that must have been hairy. That's, uh, that's only eight miles across there. You could... Uh, well, that Gibraltar was armed to the teeth with, you know, anti-aircraft and surface guns, so I think the Germans kind of kept away. <laughs> that's correct. You're under the protection of the, the forts on the side there. Good. See, that was one of the things that bothered the Navy because aircraft and so forth dirigibles could only patrol so far out to sea. <clears throat> then you were on your own. They, all you had was your destroyer escorts for protection. It wasn't until later on that bombers and so forth could travel several thousand miles out to sea and protect the watch for submarines and so forth. So technology was what really won our war, I think. You talked about 
earlier demagnetizing your ship before you ever started. Are you still on the same ship? Yeah, the Benito Juarez, yeah. The Benito Juarez? And did you see other ships all around you uh, in the Mediterranean? And then when you came out into the Atlantic, you kind of dispersed? And where, where did you go when you came, left uh, Africa? Where did you sail to? We, we, we made several trips. And then we came back. Uh, where did I go then? Were you going back to the States, or were you picking up cargo now in England, and taking it cargo. to Africa? Yeah. And then we, uh, after the invasion, we ferried stuff to the, uh, for the after the invasion, was we uh, a month. We started hauling supplies in, but they could still see wreckage in the harbor. Yeah, uh, is this the Normandy invasion? No, well, Omaha, around that area. Okay, I can't remember the names now, but. All right, where did you put into? Where, where, where were you able to dock a ship like that? You anchored out, out to sea, and they. Well, we had those they, little... They take the stuff in on barges. Barges and, yeah. and so forth like that. And we have to unload it right onto the barges. In fact, they hired the Navy crew to unload five-gallon jerry cans of gasoline to get it off fast enough, you know, so I, could, so I got a little extra pay that way. <laughs> and. Uh, you, you spoke a moment ago of seeing wrecked ships and, and yes. damage. Tell us what you saw, because you were there, uh, this is July of 44 now. Uh, right around there, yeah. What, well, what did you see? Well, there was a, a cargo ship that made it into port, and you could drive a, a Mack truck through the hole in the bow, and others was hitting the stern and had made it. Oh, it was, you begin, boy, we we're lucky. The Benito Juarez, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to move you faster along this track, but were you ever hit or bombed on this ship? Well, I got, we get ahead of ourselves here. It was a William H. Prescott was on the second ship. That was the one that went back and forth to, uh, from Southampton to mm -hmm. Algiers and Oran. Was it a sister ship of the Juarez, another Liberty it ship? Was, they were all on the same guy, <laughs> same plans. Where, when did you leave the uh, Juarez and, and go to another ship? This Prescott, is it? William, William Prescott? Yeah. Uh, when did you leave the Juarez? We left that in, in New York. And got this other ship. Yeah, uh, in fact, oh, that was, after I got off, well, to Brooklyn Navy, I'm God, sent her in Brooklyn. And all my buddies were leaving. We were there at Thanksgiving time. So that must nail it down somehow. <laughs> and uh, I see all my buddies leaving, you know. Oh, they're shipping out here and shipping out there. I went up to the office and I said, hey, what about me? I'd like to ship out too. And about the two hours later, I was on my way up to the docks and picked up a Benito Juarez because a fellow had been taken sick on board, William H. Prescott, and I was a re replacement. And the new crew was all, re all uh, drive wet behind the ears. They hadn't been out before. So you're an old salt oh, by this salt. time. <laughs> per se. Can you rem remember where you went first in this new ship now? No, I can't really. Somewhere in here, um, you got out into the Pacific. Is that yeah. correct? And. Uh, 
is, is there anything else you want to tell us about the Mediterranean or the Atlantic before we get you to the other side of the world? Any other adventures in the uh, Mediterranean? No, Anything it's just to get bombed when you get, get out into the Atlantic and the Hinkle 111 dropped bombs but didn't hit anything. And that's where we, we used up all our ammunition. <laughs> With the uh, 20 millimeters guns were all out of ammunition after that. Tell us about this now. This is an attack on your ship. Uh, you know, when you're under attack, your mind goes blank. You try to follow your instincts and do what you were supposed to do, you know? And I, I can't remember anything about it, really. You're so busy. It was it always amazed me, you know? I can't remember a thing about it. It's a lot of noise. How far off the coast were you that a Hinkle would attack you? Oh, well, probably 10 miles, probably. Not too far. Okay, can you tell us what you do recall about the attack? What I could do? Where, where were you uh, on the ship? Were you at your post? Steering 20 millimeter gun. And somebody else, bomber or attack, or, or uh, was there a signal on board the ship, yeah. general quarters, general something quarters, like that? Yeah. And then you see a German plane. Uh, someone spotted it, yeah. I think I was down below somewhere. Come running up under the deck, get yeah. to your gun. Did you fire at the plane? I was, the, the, the crew on the 20 millimeter shot. All of 20 millimeters let go, you know. Anybody hit the plane? I couldn't hit the rods. I was bound <laughs> over the pig. I take, just it, to I take them it off. that's a no. You know, if you're in a feel this flat coming up, you, you lose your cool. So that's the whole idea, scare the pilot. You told me before that uh, part of one of the bombs landed on the deck. The, the fin from the bomb, yeah. So he must have gotten pretty close. Pretty close, yeah. But he didn't hit the ship. Well, you were lucky again. <laughs> My luck didn't run out yet. Yeah. All right. Take us to the Pacific now. I came home, had leave, and, and uh, I came home for a seven-day leave. I was in Framingham at the time, up on Western Avenue. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny now. My friends were still... Well, I had one friend that had a murmur in his heart. He couldn't go, but we you know, we enjoyed ourselves. Then we went, we got, no, we went to Chicago, down to New Orleans, from New Orleans, went over, over the Rockies. To San, San Bruno, California. We had more small arms training and, and marching and so forth there. And oh, we trained in 40 millimeter. Now, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of my zone. Boy, we went down to. Uh, San Francisco picked up a passenger ship and went out to Saipan. And we, we knew it was a code, C-O-D-E, no hold. We only, what the heck is that? Well, that was the destination, but no one knew it. Was code Saipan. was the code word for Saipan? Yeah. Uh, Saipan was... Um, June of 44, and now you had picked up, is this a, a totally different ship? Well, it was, um, what do you call a passenger ship in the service? <laughs> a, tr a troop transport? Troop transport, yeah. Okay, and was your job the same on this ship, to guard the ship? No, I was no. completely out of the armed guard. Okay, what were you doing on this ship? We were nothing. 
eight, slept eight and slept till we got to Saipan. Oh, you went as a, pa a, a passenger? Yeah. No duty on board the ship? Because we didn't know what we were going to do. Neither did you know where you were going, is no, that no correct? No idea. And when did they announce to you over some loudspeaker, we're pulling well, up to an island pretty soon? When we were close to the island, they said we're going to Saipan. And what, what <laughs> Never do you heard of it. <laughs> what, what did you think you were going to do ashore? Did you have duties that uh, they expected of you or on board the ship? Well, it, we were <clears throat> the Naval Supply Depot and uh, the, the ships would bring the cargo into Saipan Harbor dock and it would be unloaded. Trucks would bring it up to the warehouse and our job was to take it and separate it into different, you know, this ship goes here and that ship goes there, the cargo and that cargo here. And when that ship came into dock to pick it up, we'd get it ready to put it on the trucks to take it down to put it on that particular ship. We kept track of their cargo. Was the island uh, secure at this time? The, the fighting was over? Uh, when I first got there, they'd send out a patrol every morning to mop up the uh, Japanese. Because uh, a week before we got there, the Japanese had come down and and shot up the chow line. And um, after that, it was secure. Now, they secured it about three weeks after that, so you could travel around. Did you have any relationship with the Marine Corps at this point? Did you see any of the uh, Never Marines? Never had anything to do with the Marine Corps, no. Okay. The and Glory Boys? <laughs> yeah, the Glory Boys. Um, the ships that you were loading, where, where were they going? Were they getting ready for another island up the oh, chain yeah. somewhere? They, you know, they go to Okinawa and wherever they went. And how long did you do this, Ev? I was there uh, just short of a year. And uh, it was pretty good duty out there because you could, our uh, chief, Officer was a good guy. He let us have a jeep, and he even go with us. We'd go up in the hills and pick bananas and stuff like that. Were you there then when the, when the war ended? Yes. Tell us about that. You're on, you're on Saipan, in the Marianas, and the war is uh, well. It was up. Okinawa was. Uh, under attack, going yeah. on at the end of it. Um, how did you hear about what was going on elsewhere? Did you guys um, listen to radios or? S well, the Navy was good to us. They gave us a nice big radio. To, we played records on it and everything. <laughs> <laughs> we got all the news that way. Of course, it was all these ships coming in. All these tell stories what's going on. Lots of news coming in from the, the guys. Got, yeah. We were even close enough to where they developed some, some of the pictures from the raids they had. We had pictures of Kwajalein you wouldn't believe. Just nothing standing higher than that. Anyway, what's next? <laughs> well, I, I'm interested in that you were at a very historic place. Uh, did you see any go around and looked at any signs of the battles? And, oh, um, that was another thing. The uh, Japanese tried to persuade us not to shoot down the, uh, do anything to the factories where they processed sugar, because that was their main crop over there was sugar cane. And intelligence said that that building was full of German, uh, Japanese soldiers. And I got the word from a buddy that was on the U.S. Mississippi, uh, Massachusetts that when they got word that they were hiding out there, they just cut that building right down to the foundation. Everything was gone. And there were, that was another thing, there wasn't much standing when we got there. Gee, they did a good job on that island. <laughs> they had to because they, they were always hiding in caves and popping up and shooting, you know, sniping. 
I, I wondered about that. If you, if you arrived at this island before it was fully secured, uh, how long after that did you finally feel safe that you could go around? About a month. About a month. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a little scary to uh, be someplace where they had come down and shot up a chow line? Oh, yeah, but he was there. Where are you going to go? Yeah, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good question. You're on Saipan. The war ended. You must have had quite a few points by this time. You'd been in the service a I long did. time. But I, I wanted to, what they call it, strike for uh, Get another the promotion. Officers. Yeah. So I, I studied up and got storekeeper for third class. What what was your rank at this time? I was seaman first. Seaman first. Until I made. That's well done. And you wanted to go on and become a petty officer. Were you thinking of shipping over for another couple of years? Well, all our buddies decided, gee, we're gonna, this is pretty good duty, we'll sign over. <laughs> Question when you get, I had to make more points to get out. That was the whole thing that killed me. <laughs> so all my buddies went home and I was still on Saipan. So I didn't mind. <laughs> what were you going to do? <laughs> you were up there picking bananas up and. Yeah. <laughs> You finally got to the point, though, that uh, you were going to go home. Uh, tell us about going home from Saipan. Were you lucky enough to get an airplane, or did you oh, no, sail no, home? I was on the uh, born, home, born Home Richard. Really? Another, another uh, aircraft carrier. No, wait a minute. Did I put it down there? No, it wasn't. That's OK. But you sailed home. Yeah. And uh, sailed from Saipan, did you stop off at, say, Honolulu or anywhere, or go directly to the west coast? He went to Guam. Guam. Guam first. Pick up people there. Pick up people, yeah. And then head right head to the States? Right to the States, yeah. What port did you pull into in the States? San Francisco. Can you tell us about sailing under the bridge, and <laughs> be, knowing you were home? <laughs> up, up on deck throwing pennies up at the bridge. <laughs> Which is a long way up there. <laughs> and were you, were you discharged where? They shipped me into Boston. They, they took you home and then discharged in Boston. Yeah, yeah. And with in. what rank now? Seaman first. To storekeeper third. Storekeeper third. And with what decorations did you have? I had the... Uh, European, Africa, Pacific, and American. Yeah, American. And I'm trying to figure out if you were in long enough to get good conduct, or you'd done something well, I terrible. I good conduct, and I got a bronze star on the African campaign. Can you tell us about getting the bronze star? That's quite a decoration. I don't know why I got it. I always was confused because well, it was kind of the attack and Was it because of the being on the ship probably. than when it was bombed? Yeah. What were your feelings about coming home? You'd been away a long time. Well, <laughs> fixed emotions. <laughs> you get kind of like to see you and uh, all it goes with it, you know, but then you miss your, your folks and so forth. Well, I wasn't married or anything. I hadn't even had a girlfriend, so I was free as a breeze. You felt you got some catching up to do then? Yeah, I guess so. you were home. When you came home, uh, did you sit and talk with your family about where you'd been and what you'd seen and oh, what yeah, you'd done? Yeah. And what did they think of that? hometown boy, and then you're talking to them about Africa, Straits of Gibraltar, Saipan. Well, people at the time hadn't traveled that much, so they were interested in other countries and travel, so for a while it was pretty good talking. <laughs> Have you ever gone back to any of these places? No, I, 
a friend of mine that I met, I was with in Saipan, he had gone back to Saipan and told me about it. It was nothing like it was. All the warehouses are gone and it's a tourist attraction now. Yeah. I meant perhaps Swansea or Liverpool or... Uh... I've always wanted to go back, but at the last minute things didn't work out. I wanted to go back to see uh, Peck. I had R and R over there in uh, Cardiff, England, and from Cardiff we went to the Lambda where this Peck was, and they gave us, you know, three or four days of recreation and it's relaxation. In, is this in Wales? Hmm? Is this in Wales? Landiff. Landiff. Outside of Cardiff. That's Wales. All right. Yeah, Wales. It's a nice and country. He, you know, he had a beautiful home, all brick, and uh, they had that peat for heat. <laughs> <laughs> he was a minister of foods over there, which was quite nice. And we slept in a, in a feather bed. Oh, you'd sink right down into the... <laughs> wow. You have some pretty good memories of that yeah, then. Yeah. That's good. Did you join any uh, unit of the military reserve, the Naval Reserve, after you got home? I, I, had, I was... Uh, I had to because it was mandatory when they let me out. I'd be in the reserves for four years. So I didn't mind. All right. And, and how about a uh, veterans organization, such as the American Legion or Veterans of Foreign yeah, Wars? I joined the uh, American Legion over in Sherbin, post 237, which was very active when I got out. They were fantastic until they went, they petered out, I would say. They went defunct. So I'm still a legionnaire. I got a lifetime membership. Oh, good. Have you received any veterans' benefits? Uh, hospitalization, the GI Bill, GI I, insurance, something like that? The GI like Bill, that. I bought a home on. I, was, I didn't spend much money when I was in the service, because you didn't make much anyway, but I saved enough for a down payment on a home, and the GI Bill guaranteed my loan. That's all I ever used. Have you ever attended any reunions? Uh, of men you served with, anything well, like that? Well, I, I signed up for the armed guard reunions, and so I never went to a reunion, but I met some of the men that I was with. In fact, they came out to Southboro and I, to a relative out there, and I, you know, met them out there. But I never did much more with it. How important have for you was serving in the military? Well, I thought I, I did my part. I mean, the more people that helped out, the better the, co the uh, consequences. Do you feel that, that in any way it affected the rest of uh, your life? I think so, yeah. In what way? Well, I, I uh, learned respect for authority and, uh, you know, I did my, I do my duty without any, you know, no, no task seemed to be too hard for me when I got out because some of the stuff was pretty hard we did. Mm -hmm. No, I think I got a pretty good deal out of it. I helped the country. You, when you look back on it, can you tell us is there one most memorable experience something that you think about uh, more often, say, than anything else that happened to you in the service? Oh, the awful destruction and the senseless. The poor people that lost their lives. The, uh, well, uh, what, what a country can do when it's fully geared up, people are all behind it, you know. Just not get overrun. <laughs> I guess that's about it. Is there a 
a person that you can think of that you remember from your military time, a most memorable character? Not really. Some of the uh, chief petty officers I, I met were memorable, I don't know. Just good G.I. Joes, I guess. Good buddies. Good buddies, yeah. You went through a lot of uh, anguish and you were under fire, but still I have to ask you, was there a f funny thing that happened to you, a humorous experience in your career? Well, it happened uh, on Saipan, I guess. The uh, story was that Garapan P. I had a good, uh, not Garapan, what, some place had a, oh, Malby, Malby Point Country Club had a, uh, as a country club. And you'd hear them come, hey, uh, how do you get to Malby Point Country Club? And we say, you're hearing things, there's no such thing. That went on and on. These guys wanted to know where it was, it was a good time. And it wasn't no such thing. I don't know if that's funny or not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's nice that they, they kept looking for the place. Oh, GIs always wanted a good time. Absolutely. Is there anything that I haven't asked you this morning that uh, your family's going to get a copy of this tape and you are, historians are going to look at it, but is there something that you'd like to add that I haven't thought to ask you this morning? Well, I, I want to say that Baron the War it was a good vacation, a good uh, experience to see these places. You, you know, you, I've, I've traveled some since I got out, but never to these places. I've always wanted, well, we did go to England, uh, but no place where I were, like Swansea, uh, in South Wales, I never got down to where I was. Uh, I guess that's about it. All right, Everett Kimball, thank you for coming in today. We appreciate I it. I hope I wasn't too jabberish. Absolutely not. <laughs> okay.